In what follows, we're going to continue with discussing B2B technologies and business models. In the previous section, we already clarified B2C, business to consumer, and we briefly touched upon business to business. We also mentioned that business to business is totally different than business to consumer. Business to business involves longer term relationships, more complex relationships, and often also a higher stickiness. We also already indicated that B2B usually is a much larger share of the overall revenue of e-business than B2C. So in what follows, we are first going to give an introduction to B2B and discuss the changing supply chain. Then we're going to talk about B2B technologies. First of all, we're going to look into traditional EDI, electronic data interchange. And we are also going to discuss internet XML-based frameworks. That will be followed by a discussion of B2B business models, whereby we're going to zoom into sell-side B2B, buy-side B2B, e-marketplaces, and we're going to conclude with discussing private industrial networks. Here's the setting that we're going to use as um, a framework to discuss the remainder of the section. So companies can operate according to a built-to-order philosophy, like Dell, whereby products are being built as they are being ordered by the customers, or they can also operate according to a ship-to-order philosophy, whereby products are being shipped as they are ordered by the customers. Remember that every company has two sides. It has a B2C side, which is the interface to the customers, the consumers, which is what we already discussed in the previous section, but it also has a B2B side, which is a supply chain management side, and that will be the focus of this particular section the B2B side, which is the interaction with the suppliers. Now, what is supply chain management? Well, supply chain management, here you can see a definition of it. Of course, you don't have to memorize it, but supply chain management is the coordination of production, inventory, location, transportation, and information, really very important, among the participants in a supply chain to achieve the best mix of responsiveness and efficiency for the market being served. So you see, a lot of things need to be considered here. The coordination, the production, the inventory, the location, transportation, and also, very important, the information flow. That will be particularly important from a business information systems perspective. ESCM is then electronic supply chain management. That will be the collaborative use of technology, web-based technology predominantly, for conducting SCM activities. Now, in the Year 2000, uh, lots of predictions were being made by companies like Gartner, and they predicted that, for example, a staggering 7.3 million worth of global corporate spending would go through the internet in 2004, up from $145 billion in 1999. Another prediction made by Gartner at that time was that the entire supply chain between suppliers and buyers will be automated. Now. Supply chain management has evolved a lot, but not all industries have been equally affected by B2B e-commerce. The ones that have been very sophisticated at doing B2B e-business are especially computer industry, think about Dell, automobile, automotive industry, the chemical industry, industrial equipment. Those are the ones where a competitive advantage has been created by means of e-business in a supply chain management setting. And we're going to discuss some, of, some examples of these in the remainder of this chapter. Now, if you look at how a traditional supply chain looked, well, a traditional supply chain was something that was very linear. It was very structured. It was what we call point to point. We had tier three suppliers, tier two suppliers, tier one supplier. Then we had a manufacturer, which basically assembled the products together. Then a distributor, which distributed the products to the retailers and the retailers, which then directly sold the products to the end consumer, to the customer. So it was highly structured and it was very linear. It was what we call point to point. It was not very flexible. It was not very agile, right? So the chain was something that was linear, point to point, tight couplings, very intense coupled relationships were established at that time. Now with the internet, we can aim for loose coupling. Loose coupling means that you're going to set up a very flexible architecture according to a plug-and-play philosophy, where you have a distributor, 
retailers, logistic providers, manufacturers, maybe some virtual manufacturers, some contract manufacturers, some suppliers, tier one, tier two, tier three. And the purpose is to set up a very flexible architecture there, such that if you want to unplug one particular party, such that you can do it without any problem. And if you want to plug in another party, such that you can do it with any, without any problem. So in order to accomplish this very ambitious goal, we need to have the appropriate underlying ICT technology. So our information systems should be versatile, should be flexible, should be agile, such that we can accomplish this aim of the future internet-driven supply network, such that we can accomplish this aim of setting up a plug-and-play architecture. So we should aim at loose coupled relationships. That is really very important here. By doing so, or chains, or linear chains, as we knew them from uh, previous, previously, or chains will evolve into collaborative networks, where different partners can collaborate in a very flexible way. That will also allow us to come up with pure play or virtual companies, companies which are only present in the internet, on the internet, and which collaborate with a whole set of other partners, also only available on the internet, in order to conduct their main business. However, only a few successful examples are available of this one particular architecture. Think about Dell, think about Amazon. These are examples of setting up these collaborative networks in a particular business setting. What are the technologies that can now be used to automate all of this. And first we're gonna zoom in to traditional B2B, right? So that means that we're gonna discuss EDI, which is electronic data interchange. And then we're gonna look at some internet XML based frameworks, which are more sophisticated, which are more state of the art. Electronic data interchange is legacy. That means it's software that was used in the past. That does not mean that it is not relevant anymore because some companies are still using EDI technology nowadays. And in EDI, what you're going to do is you're going to transfer electronic data from one computer of one particular firm to another computer of another firm. So this EDI message will then be processed by the receiver's computer system without the need for human interpretation. So it can be fully automated. The EDI message that could be a purchase order will be directly read by the receiver's information system. We do not only need software to read the EDI messages, of course we also need hardware to pass on message, the message from one computer system to another. So we need value-added networks, for example. Networks that are going to add value in terms of bridging a gap or making a connection between one firm and another firm. And there have been all kinds of international standards that have been proposed to do this as sophisticated as possible. UN ADFACT, which is EDI for Administration, Commerce and Transport. And in the US you have a similar standard. The Americans always need to do things their own way. So there we used to have X12. Note that these are outdated standards since they're actually implementing an outdated technology, which is EDI. So EDI was used since the 1980s to automate routine transactions between established trading partners. It was long-term, it was a long-term relationship that was established because we had to make a point-to-point -point connection between two firms. We had to have a cable available between two firms. It was point-to-point -point and it was tightly coupled. It was not loosely coupled, it was tightly coupled. This is still being used quite widely in B2B integration practice. Here you can see how it goes. So you have two computers, you have a supplier and a manufacturer, which are going to exchange all kinds of messages like purchase orders, payments, shipping notices, price updates, and invoices. And all these messages can then be standardized as EDI, message, as EDI messages, right? So EDI is basically a syntax which will allow you to come up with a purchase order, to do a payment, to come up with a shipping notice, and so on. And there have been large EDI groups implementing EDI in particular settings. Think about Swift, for example. They had EDI protocols or EDI standards for handling international financial stand, uh, transfers. You can see how it worked, basically. So let's say we have three companies and they all want to collaborate by means of EDI, but each of these companies uses their own internal proprietary software written in old programming languages. Old programming languages like you know, COBOL, C, Pascal, but 
company A cannot talk to company B unless they agree on a common language. So the common language here is EDI. So what you're going to do is you're going to actually, for example, if company A puts a purchase order with company B, the purchase order is first specified in the own proprietary language, let's say COBOL. It is then transformed or translated into an EDI message. The EDI message is sent along a network to company B. The incoming EDI message, which is the purchase order, is then translated into language that company B understands. So let's say that company B has an information system which understands the C programming language, then the EDI message can be transformed into a message which can be understood by the C programming environment. So basically what you're doing each time is you're translating an EDI message to another particular language or you um, translate a language specific message to an EDI message, but you're um, translating all the time. And middleware is a piece of software which is actually going to do that translation for you. Middleware is just software that translates. So it translates from one language to another language. That's what it is doing. He can see an EDI message. You can see EDI, for those of you that are familiar, looks very much like XML. It also has those delimiters, delimiters, those tags like NAD, name and address of partner. You will see that popping up in the message. So it's a tag, a delimiter, which, which indicates that the name and the address of the partner follows. It has date um, delimiters, it has quantity delimiters, it has all kinds of delimiters which have been part of the standard and which can be used to exchange information in a standardized way. What are the benefits of engaging into e EDI compared to not engaging into EDI? Well, speed of transaction, you can very quickly send a purchase order from one organization to another, so speed of transaction. Reduced transaction costs, right? So, you know, you don't have to call the organization anymore. You don't have to pay receptionists which are answering the purchase order calls. You can all automate it and send purchase orders along via EDI. There are less errors, so the EDI messages have been standardized and have fixed the limiters, so there are less errors. And there are also lower inventory costs because of the efficiency of the communication flow. The inventory can also decrease, which will imply lower inventory costs. So by investing in EDI, companies can gain a competitive edge over other companies in the sector. But it's not always as sunny as it looks because the advantage for the supplier customer depends heavily on the balance of power. The balance of power between supplier and customer, let's say. Imagine that you're a very small firm and you're setting up an EDI uh, collaboration with a bigger firm. Right? Imagine that you're a, a seller of, let's say, pancakes. Right? So you sell pancakes to a big supermarket, let's say Deleza. You're only a very small firm, you're an SME. SME stands for small and medium-sized enterprise. And you want to set up an EDI collaboration with a bigger firm, with a bigger supermarket. So once the SME has made the substantial investment in the EDI infrastructure, then actually the bigger firm can start, mis can start abusing the balance of power. Because now, since it knows that the SME has made a significant investment into the appropriate hardware and software infrastructure, it can actually try and push the price downwards uh, for that SME, such that it can have those pancakes at a lower price. Because of the long-term point-to-point and tightly coupled relationship, the big firm can make um, abuse of the balance of power and it can force the small firm to decrease its prices since it has made a significant investment into the EDI technology. So this is the risk of being locked in. This is the risk of actually being too much focused in terms of your ICT architecture on one particular customer. If you're too much focused on one particular customer, you start being very dependent upon the customer, right? And the customer can lock you in. He can force you to actually decrease your prices, knowing that you are not likely to, um, to, to abandon your investment into the EDI architecture, so knowing that they can uh, have the power to reduce your prices. So this is the idea of vendor locking, and because of the high initial investment, this can be particularly an issue for SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises. 
So these are the disadvantages of EDI that are actually originating from the fact that it's long term, it's point to point, and it's a tightly coupled relationship which is being established. So it's less suitable to be used in a networked collaborative environment. So that's why it would be good if we could shift away from using these private communication networks and proprietary hardware software towards using internet technologies. And what are the internet technologies? Well, HTML is one of them. HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language, and it's the language that specifies the content of pages on the internet. Actually, it's not specifying the content. It's specifying the representation. So with HTML, we're going to specify whether certain text should be in boldface, in italics, whether it should be underlined, whether it should be a heading, whether it should be represented in a tabular format. All of that will be represented in HTML. So it's not content-oriented, but it's presentation-oriented. And because it's presentation-oriented, HTML is not that well-suited to actually do e-business. The newest version of HTML, which is HTML5, has a very simplified syntax. It is backwards compatible towards previous versions. It has various new elements like section, article, footer, canvas. It has cascading style sheets, CSS, for maintaining um, consistency in terms of formatting guidelines between different pages of a website. And it also puts an increased emphasis on the domain object model and scripting languages such as JavaScript. But as I said, it just remains a presentation-oriented standard, not focused on the content itself. And that's why it is not very suitable to be used in an electronic business environment. Presentation-oriented, it has no structural or semantic information in there. It does not allow me to do content-based querying, right? So if you have an HTML representation of an Amazon page, for example, there's no efficient way of inspecting the HTML code and finding the characteristics of a book, like the title, the authors, the price, and so on. It's not possible if we only have the HTML representation of the book. So it cannot effectively be searched and processed by business applications. So that's why XML, extensible markup language, is a lot more efficient to do this, because this is going to focus on the content. So we will not have any embedded formatting information. No formatting information. We just specify the content. The formatting itself will be specified by means of style sheets. Style sheets which are going to tell us what items should be represented in what format. Format being italics, bold, underlined, etc. So XML as such is a meta markup language. It doesn't have any fixed set of tags like HTML has. Groups of users, so business users, can define their own tags for a particular domain or purpose. Right? In banking, for example, you could actually come up with your own tags which are relevant in a banking setting. If you work in a supermarket context, you can also come up with your own tags that make sense in a supermarket setting. Now, those definitions, those XML definitions, are referred to as schemes. The schemes are used to actually define your tags and structure for a collection of XML documents. And those XML documents can then serve as a uniform data exchange between B2B applications. And I can come up with XML tags for a product catalog, for price lists, for purchase orders, invoices, inventory reports, bill of materials. So all these documents which you need in a B2B environment can be appropriately specified using XML tags. You can see an example of a catalog entry in XML. It's a notebook specification, so you can see it's not the tags are not representing the format, but they're representing the product, right? So it gives me the specs, the part number, display type, processor type, the weight, the price currency, um, the price itself, etc. So if I now want to query this catalog entry and ask for the price of this particular notebook, I can very easily do it. I can also ask for the currency and I can transform it to another currency. So XML is a very suitable format to be used in B2B e-business, you see. I could also, if I have a whole range of catalog entries, I could sort them according to price, according to processor, and so on. So using XML, we can specify the content of documents, and it's very easy to um, use this in B2B exchanges. Now companies can start exchanging XML documents which can be very efficiently understood and parsed. Right? So the XML document can be processed fully automatically. 
Um, there, there exist all kinds of XML document transformation and processing tools that will allow us to do this. Mm -hmm. Now, XML is only a data format. It's not going to tell me something about the processes, about the process of actually um, putting a purchase order with a particular firm. XML only specifies the data. So what about the business process and the messaging, right? So how am I going to chain my electronic messages, right? So when you set up a purchase transaction, typically there's a set of messages that are going to need to be, are going to exchange, right? Are going to be exchanged. So first of all, I put my purchase order with the supplier. The supplier sends me a confirmation of the purchase order. Then the supplier is going to send me the goods. Then I'm going to send a message that I received the goods. Then the supplier is going to send me the invoice. Then I'm going to send a message back that I, saying that I received the invoice and then I make the payment. So you have a set of messages which are being exchanged between me, the manufacturer, let's say, and my supplier. XML will only specify the content of those messages, but if we also want to actually structure the process model, the process of sending those messages, then we need other standards, and we need B2B business frameworks, which are technical and business descriptions of what information to share, when to share it, and with whom that we should share it. And two standards, two very well-known B2B business frameworks, are EBXML and RosettaNet. There are two standards which are going to describe the process steps in setting up or working out a purchase transaction. So they're not data uh, standards, they're process standards. XML is a data standard, that's really very important to remember. Whereas EBXML and RosettaNet are process standards. They're going to specify the process steps, the steps that one should follow in doing something particular, like um, um, issuing a purchase order. All of that in a web environment is then fully automated with web services. And the idea here is to actually establish that plug and play architecture that we clarified earlier on. Okay, so this is about the underlying technology. So let's now have a look at a classification of B2B models. Well, roughly speaking, you can make a distinction between a sell side B2B and a buy side B2B. In a sell side B2B, I have one seller, I have many buyers. Right? Usually, the seller is going to provide a shopping website with an e catalog that will allow the buyers to log on to the catalog, specify the products they want, and then order them. The seller can also sell via auctions, right? Like eBay, for example. Buyers are going to then shop directly on the seller's website, configure the products, and purchase them. In a buy side B2B, we work the other way around. So we have one buyer, we have many sellers. What is usually going to happen is that the buyer is going to aggregate the multiple sellers' catalogs and trade using reverse auctions and or negotiations. Remember, reverse auction is the auction where a buyer, for example, is interested in stationary material, let's say pens, pencils, staplers, etc. And he or she is going to ask for a quote for that particular order with various sellers and then probably is going to pick the cheapest quote. That's the whole idea of a reverse auction, remember, where there was a downward pressure on the price. This is as opposed to a forward auction where there was an upward pressure on the price. Typically, the front end should be integrated with the company's back end applications using the idea of enterprise application integration, which is what we discussed earlier on. Remember? You can see an example of a cell site model. This is Big Box. It's a very well known cell site B2B model operating in Hong Kong. Um, it's targeted at supplying a comprehensive range of office products, stationaries, and services, and so on. It has all kinds of facilities for customer companies to manage group individual accounts, track order pro progress, etc. A well-known example of a buy-side B2B model is uh, Siemens Click to Procure. Imagine that you would be a firm and you think you have an interesting uh, product or service to offer to Siemens. So you could be an interesting supplier to Siemens. What you could do is you can log on to this buy-side B2B model. You can make a profile of your firm and then specify what products or services you can offer to Siemens. Siemens will then have 
all that information loaded into their databases, relational databases, and they will have all kinds of applications to screen whether you have something interesting to offer, yes or not. This is the whole idea of the click to procure Siemens e-procurement system. This is one of the world's largest buy site B2B sites. E-marketplaces are, are actually public electronic marketplaces where many buyers and many sellers are going to connect. So it's a virtual marketplace available on the internet which is going to assemble many sellers, many buyers, and which is also going to offer all kinds of add-on services. Add-on services like catalog management, which allow us to manage catalogs, even manage multiple catalogs by multiple sellers. Support the sourcing process. Sourcing means that you want to find a source. A buyer wants to find a source. A source is the seller. So the sourcing process means that a buyer wants to find a seller. It also has services for auctioning, integrating with logistics providers, etc. Now, those e-marketplaces can become very transparent and they can also become very competitive because all information is available on the e-marketplace. Uh, it can very much encourage competitive bidding, meaning that um, you know, um, sellers are going to very much compete on the price and they have to be careful such that they are not destroying one another. That's why many suppliers are often reluctant to participate in those e-marketplaces because they know by participating, basically, they are destroying each other. And that happens, right? That happened with a marketplace in the automobile manufacturing industry called Covicent. That was a marketplace that was founded by General Motors, Ford, Daimler Chrysler, Renault and Nissan. So those are very well-known car manufacturers. And the whole idea was to create a web-based platform which allows participants to work across computer platforms, operating systems, without requiring the participating companies to make the necessary IT investment. It was not a success. Why? Because there was a split mission. The mission was basically to force prices downwards, right? to actually uh, create very efficient competition between the different suppliers. So basically what the suppliers were doing is they were actually destroying one another. So that created a lot of distrust between partners. Also, the Covicent initiative was an initiative by lots of big car manufacturers and there was a lack of leadership because nobody would allow the other manufacturer to take leadership or even ownership of that one particular e-marketplace. This also created reluctance of the suppliers. The suppliers were not willing to participate in the e-marketplace because they knew by doing so that they're going to force each other out of the market, out of the business, right? Okay, and then we had the rival technology providers software-wise. So Covicent was not really a success in terms of an e-marketplace. What was more of a success in the automobile sector was the example of supply-on. The idea of supply-on was not that much to drive prices down and create very fierce competition. Totally not. It was set up to be a lot more uh, supplier-friendly, actually as the name suggests, supply on, right? And it was established in the mid 2000s by some leading companies within the automobile supply industry. And even nowadays, there are more than 1,000 automobile industry suppliers which are gonna use this e-marketplace daily. It provides all kinds of facilities for the seller to communicate its company profile, to specify its technology and know-how, its manufacturing capabilities, for the buyer to identify potential suppliers to create distribution lists, etc. Of course, it also has a sourcing manager. A sourcing manager is a piece of software which will allow you to find the source, to allow you to find a supplier for your particular request. So I can create an RFQ. RFQ stands for request for a quote. So a buyer can say, I want to buy this item. Give me a quote. Give me a price quote for it. RFQ, request for a quote. I can then define or add a quotation form. We can also attach drawings, technical applications, CAD CAM designs, and so on. The seller can then open the RFQ, request for a quote, open any attached document, and then send the quotation along to the buyer. This can also be then uh, automated in a bidding process, right? Whereby uh, quotations can be compared, can be compared in terms of their 
price can be compared in terms of their delivery terms or can be compared in terms of the quality based upon reviews which are also available on the marketplace for example. So bidding is also part of the functionality which is typically provided by supply on. In order to be fully integrated with the existing legacy applications, the supply on marketplace also has um, an interface with EDI, right? So it will allow us to come up with EDI based messages such that we can set up EDI communications and so on. It also has XML interfaces, right? Here you can see it again, so we have the buy side company, the sell side company, by means of the supply on web EDI, we can just uh, send purchase orders along, prototype orders, advanced shipping notations, notifications, self-billing invoices, re-evaluation, etc. So all of that can be passed along through the e-marketplace. Types of e-marketplace as well. We can categorize e-marketplaces in various ways. We can uh, categorize e-marketplaces in terms of the types of transactions. Spot buying means that you're buying on the spot. So it's the purchase of goods and services as they are needed, usually at prevailing market prices. Strategic sourcing is then the purchases that involve long-term contracts. And contracts that are usually based upon private negotiations between sellers and buyers with agreed upon terms and quality. So there's a big difference between both. We can also categorize e-marketplaces in terms of the types of materials that are being traded. We can have direct materials, which are materials which are directly used in the production process, steel in a car, paper for a book. Indirect materials, which are materials that are used to support production. MRO, which is maintenance, repair and operation. These are indirect materials which are used in activities that support production. We can also categorize e-marketplaces in terms of the direction of the train. Vertical means that you have a marketplace that is going to deal with one industry or industry segment, like steel or chemicals or automobiles. So it's going to actually provide functionality across the different business units within a particular industry or industry segment. This is opposed to a horizontal marketplace. This is a marketplace which is going to concentrate on one particular service, material or product, that is used in all types of industries. As an example of a horizontal marketplace, think about a marketplace that is actually trading office supplies or computers. Well, these are items which are uh, necessary in a variety of different industries, okay? Not only in one. Degree of openness could also be a way of looking at e-marketplaces. Here you can see some examples, and you definitely don't need to memorize all of the firms here. Um, based upon what businesses buy, how businesses buy it, spot purchasing, on the spot, long-term, longer-term relationships, horizontal, vertical, indirect inputs, direct inputs. You can see some further examples because they were not all that successful. One Iro, this is a marketplace um, which is gonna connect airlines, OEMs, that stands for Original Equipment Manufacturers, and aviation repair facilities to streamline the overhaul and repair business using the internet. Utilia, that was a marketplace for the sale and purchase of electricity and related equipment. And then eMerge, eMerge was um, for online cattle exchange. Sadly, this one is no longer with us. It filed for bankruptcy in 2007. Okay, eMarketplaces are publicly available and are going to bring together potentially thousands of sellers and buyers in a single digital marketplace. A PIN stands for Private Industrial Network is going to bring together a small number of strategic business partners who are going to collaborate, typically relation-based, to develop highly responsive and highly efficient supply chains. So a private industrial network is relation-based. It's private. It's shielded from the outside world. This is as opposed to an e-marketplace. An e-marketplace is publicly available. A PIN is not publicly available. It is relation-based, it is private, it is hidden from the outside world, and it permits firms and partners to share product design, development, marketing, scheduling, inventory management, and do and all kinds of unstructured communication. So it's collaborative commerce whereby a set of partners based upon their relationships, which are private, are gonna set up collaborative commerce 
collaborations. Okay, here you can see an example of a PIN, you know, private industrial network. Um, so we have suppliers, we have manufacturers, Procter and Gamble, we have distributors, Spartan stores, and J.C. Penney as a retailer, which is well known in the United States. So you see. Um, this is a private industrial network. It's just a set of businesses which set up a private uh, collaboration hidden from the outside world. So you cannot just join this PIN unless you're being invited by the partners. The goal of these PINs, private industrial networks, is to deal with what we call the bullwhip effect. And here you can see the bullwhip effect being uh, illustrated. So let's have a look at that linear supply chain that we clarified earlier. So we had a supplier, a manufacturer, a distributor, a retailer, and a consumer. And usually each one of those needs to decide upon how much inventory they are going to keep. And the inventory is usually determined by the forecast of the needs downstream. So the inventory for the retailer depends upon the forecast consumer demand. So the retailer is going to make use of business intelligence, business analytics, or data mining, if you want, to actually project or predict customer demand. Then the retailer is going to make sure that he or she has enough production in order to uh, be able to, suffi to sufficiently uh, handle the customer demand. And typically, you're going to see that they're going to keep a little bit of excess inventory. So what you see is that a small variation in customer demand is going to lead up to a bigger variation in the retailer inventory. Because the retailer wants to make sure that he or she has enough products or services in inventory to uh, deal with the customer demand. Now the distributor in turn will project using business analytics, data mining, the retailer demand. The distributor will also make sure that he or she has excess inventory in order to sufficiently accommodate retailer demand. So you see that a small fluctuation in retailer demand will create, actually, will create actually a bigger fluctuation in distributor inventory level. So basically what you see is that the variability in the inventory increases as you go up the supply chain. So a small variability in customer demand will create a bigger variability in inventory as you climb up the supply chain. And that's the bullwhip effect. It's like when you actually are hitting with a bullwhip, you have a small fluctuation at the beginning, which becomes bigger and bigger as you're approaching the end of the whip. One way to deal with this is by using a technology which is called Vendor Managed Tech Inventory, or VMI, whereby a company is going to manage inventory levels of its usually downstream value ch chain partners based on forecasted demand and prior agreements on minimum and maximum stock levels. So now, as a supplier, you can get access to the inventory of the manufacturer. You get direct access to it. So the supplier or the seller will then be able to optimize production planning and the overall supply chain efficiency, which is one way of countering the bullwhip effect. The buyer needs to open up his inventory to the supplier, to the seller, which means that he's losing some control, but in return for that, he's going to get some cost savings, which can then be translated into a more competitive end consumer price. So vendor managed inventory means that a seller gets access to the inventory levels of the buyer, and that way the seller can actually optimize the production planning, and that can create some cost savings. Sometimes it can go wrong as well. A couple of years ago, Nike was using data mining or business analytics to do demand forecasting, to forecast demand for particular Nike sport shoes. Well, actually, because the forecasting systems did not work fairly well, the software, the analytics or data mining software, caused the stock value to plummet nine months later. Because of the fact that they relied on these projections, on the outcome of those data mining models, Nike ended up ordering the wrong type of shoes, being the Air Garden 2, which is one particular type of shoes. Now, the analytics software, or the data mining software, had indicated that those shoes were going to be in high demand. That turned out to be not the case. They turned out to be poor sellers. So, Nike was confronted with this um, huge amount of Air Garden 2 stock that they could not sell. And the reason that this um, 
uh, did not work very well is because the analytical models or the data model, data mining models were not well estimated, were not well designed because of the garbage in, garbage out idea. That means if you have bad data, you're going to end up with bad models. Hmm? Poor integration with existing systems and also the management that thought that those data mining techniques were going to be magic, so they were blindly trusting those data mining models, which is something that you should never do. And um, actually, um, that's why it did turn out to be a disaster for Nike. Hmm? Walmart is also um, doing lots of investments in this particular field. They developed a collaborative uh, commerce already in the late 1980s. In the 1990s, they introduced Retail Link, which is a kind of bin private industrial network connecting Walmart's largest suppliers to Walmart's inventory management system. So it's also a kind of VMI, Vendor Managed Inventory. And they used that system and upgraded then to a collaborative resource planning, forecasting and replenishment system. So you see all those developments like PINs and Vendor Managed Inventory are used a lot by these big firms. Okay. Online advertising is the next section. So in what follows, we're going to see how you can do advertising on the internet. And you may have noted that there are various ways of doing advertising on the internet. Okay, what is advertising? First, the definition, which you should not memorize, but is defined as a paid, mediated form of communication from an identifiable source designed to persuade the receiver to take some action. That will typically be a purchase, of course now or in the future. Online advertising means that we're going to do this advertising on the internet. And the internet will offer us with a whole range of different facilities, different means to do online advertising. Here you can see the US online advertising market pictured between 1996 and 2012. You see that it keeps on increasing. There are only two bumps, right? Uh, early 2000s when we had the dot-com bubble burst, remember? We already spoke about that. And then around 2008 when we had the financial crisis. But the overall trend is increasing. You can see the online advertising market in Western Europe between 2010-2014. You can see it's increasing as well. There exist different types of online advertising, and in, in what follows, we will extensively comment on them. The most important ones are search advertising, display, banner advertising, mobile advertising, digital video, sponsorship, rich media, and email. Right? So we're going to comment on all of them as we proceed through this section. Mm -hmm. What are the types of online advertising? So we have email advertising, display, search-based advertising, ad network advertising, social advertising, online sponsorship, coupon advertising, and viral marketing. Email advertising is the first one, and it's really email advertising is not that very effective. Right? It is actually very inefficient because for many of us, if we, if we receive ads by email or spam filter, we'll filter them out, right? So they will be perceived as spam. So it's not often used, you know, it's not very efficient. We can do better than just email advertising. Display advertising means that you're going to have an advertisement that could be a banner, which is displayed on a web page and which is going to provide a link to the website of the advertiser. The publisher is a website, is going to provide content, sometimes for free but not necessarily, and all kinds of services like email, instant messaging, and so on. Of course, this works best when the volume of viewer traffic is large or highly specialized. If you have a publisher, with lots of visitors, then advertising is going to work very well. Right? Think about Yahoo. Yahoo is a portal website, has lots of visitors, so advertising is going to work very well on the Yahoo website. It is also going to work very well when you have a very particular or specific audience. Think about the example I already gave earlier about Seniorenet. This is a, a portal for elderly, retired people. So that's also very attractive for advertisers as you know the ads you can put on our website or ads targeted at older people. So a portal is very um, attractive for advertising. Social network sites can also be very attractive for advertising and so on. The internet allows for 
interactivity so we can establish a two-way communication and very high user engagement. And, you know, we can also aim for different levels of intrusiveness. That means interruption in the user's online experience. Intrusiveness can be low. That means that customers just have to click on a banner and they only do it when they want, right? So if you don't want to look at a banner, you're not going to look at it. So it's not bothering you a lot. It has a low intrusiveness. High intrusiveness is a pop-up or a pop-under. This is a window which appears in front of another window and it can get very annoying because basically you want to see the information on the window behind the pop-up, so you need to close the pop-up. So it needs, so it's actually having a high level of intrusiveness. It's bothering you quite a bit during your uh, website visit. The challenge for online advertising is to be sufficiently intrusive without encouraging consumers to invest in things like anti-ad tools, pop-up blockers, and so on. You want to make sure, as an advertiser, that people see your message, but you also want to make sure that they do not get frustrated with it. Huh? So that's a big challenge in developing uh, online advertising campaigns. There exist different types of ad formats. There exist text ads, uh, skyscrapers, banner ads. They can be static. Static means that they're just having textual information. They can also contain rich media. They contain uh, videos, they can and they contain games, etc. A pop-up is a very annoying thing, if you ask me. That's a window that pops up in front of another window with a message. A pop-under is a, a window that appears below another window. You don't see it initially, but if you close the first window, then you're going to see that there's still one window remaining, which is the pop-under. Very frustrating, if you ask me. You can, fortunately, you can stop that using pop-up stoppers, blockers, and killers. Pop under, well, I just mentioned this. This is a page which is um, being loaded below another page. You can see all of them illustrated, right? To the left, we have some text ads which have been put there by Google. We have a banner ad above, and we have a skyscraper to the right. Looks like a skyscraper, basically, hence the name. This is a pop-up. Right? and you have to close it, so it's a high level of intrusiveness. You always have to close it before you can go to the page behind the pop-up. We also have interstitials. An interstitial is a full page which is loaded before the actual page that you want to visit. This is going to last for a few seconds, and then you will be reverted to the intended page. Right? You can see an interstitial of base, which is a telco provider in Belgium. So it's first being loaded. You have to watch it before you can go to the actual uh, VTM page. Okay. Layer ads. Uh, these are ads that scroll down as the visitor scrolls down the page. Uh, this is when advertisers want quick attention and action. Usually they're quite expensive. So, And there have been some um, ways of standardizing them by the Interactive Advertising Bureau. Here you can see an example of a layer ad. So you can see a tax document of a teacher that has been hit by a car outside a particular school. So what happens is that when you do layer ads, the software is going to analyze the news message and it sees that it's about cars and there's an ad for Toyota appearing. This is actually not a very appropriate ad because it's an ad by a car of a car accident and then you see an ad for Toyota appearing. It's a news, I mean, it's a news document for a car accident and you see an ad of Toyota appearing. So it's not very appropriate if you ask me. But that's the idea of layer ads. And depending where you're at in the text, other types of layer ads could of course appear. Now many of us, including myself, suffer from internet ad avoidance. That means all of us have our favorite websites, news websites, sports websites, gaming websites, Facebook, etc. And if we use the website quite frequently, we kind of know um, where the ads are situated, where the banners are. And we're not looking at them anymore because that's not of interest to us anymore. So internet avoidance is a real problem for advertisers because many people are not going to look at uh, their banners or are going to click on it. So banners have typically very low click-through rates, typically less than 1%. So less than 1% of the visits or visitors are going to click on a banner. Users typically also suffer from banner blindness. That means that after a while, you kind of know where the banners are placed on a particular website, 
and you're not going to spend attention to them anymore. So you're actually blind for them. Okay? This is studied in an empirical study by Chu and Xi'an by 2004. You don't have to know the bullets below that. Okay. Search-based advertising is a very attractive way of doing advertising, right? Um, you can do unpaid search advertising or paid search advertising. Unpaid search advertising means that you're not going to pay a search engine like Google or Yahoo, but you're going to make sure that your website has been well designed such that it can be easily detected, found by Yahoo. If you have a website which is selling computers, um, then you want to make sure if somebody enters by computers in Google that your website ranks highly in the search results. You can do that by designing your website in a smart, intelligent way, by making sure the appropriate information is on your website, and by making sure it has the appropriate incoming links. This is unpaid search advertising, also referred to as search engine optimization. So it means you're going to optimize your website in such a way that a search engine can very easily find it, and a search engine can very easily detect it. On the contrary, we can also pay Google or the search engine to include a link to our website. This is paid search advertising. So I'm going to pay a search engine to include a link to my website. And we can do that according to various formulas. We can do paid inclusion. Paid inclusion means that you're just going to pay a search engine in order to be included in the search results. right? Paid placement means that you pay a search engine in order to be put on a particular place in a search result. Obviously, you want to arrive as high as possible in the search results. Well, with paid placement, you guarantee top listings. So you, a link to your website will appear very high in the search results. With paid inclusion, you're just guaranteed that a link to your website will appear in the search results. With paid placement, you know that it's going to uh, appear very high. With Google, this can all be very nicely implemented using the ideas of search engine optimization. Google AdWords or Google AdSense. Let's have a closer look. Search engine optimization is illustrated here. So you see you have a Google query, open bank account, and you have some um, links to websites which are called sponsored links, right? This is part of the paid search Google AdWords. Above and to the right, you see paid search Google AdWords. These are companies which are actually paying Google in order to include a link to their um, um, website in those sponsored link sections. Below that, in green, you can see the organic search results. These are companies which did not pay Google, but have designed their website in such a way that if somebody enters open bank account, a link to their website will appear very high in the organic, in the spontaneous Google search results. Hmm. Search engine optimization means it's unpaid, you just optimize your website to improve the ranking in the search results. So that means that you have to keep it easy for search bots to search your website. What is a search bot? A search bot is a piece of software from Google, from Yahoo, which is going to search the web and give information to Google or Yahoo. So it's the piece of software which Google and Yahoo uses to continuously look on the internet for new websites, new information, websites with new information, etc. Okay, so we need to keep it easy for search bots to search our website and we can do that by specifying the necessary information in the files robot.txt or by appropriately specifying a sitemap and I'm going to give some examples of that in a moment. The URLs which I will create should also be simple and easy to understand. You can see an example there. I also need to make sure that other sites link to my site because that's the way the Google PageRank algorithm is going to work. In a moment, I'll be explaining that. I may, should make sure that specific keywords are included in titles, meta tags, in headers, in boldface, and so on. I should also avoid being penalized because of spamming. A link form is a malicious way of improving your results in a search engine optimization campaign. What is a link form? A link form is um, a configuration whereby you're going to have lots of dummy websites linking to your website to make your website very important. So a link form is just trying to fool Google. You set up many websites which are fictitious, 
which have no relevant information whatsoever, but which all link to your website. And by doing that, Google could think that your website is actually very important and rank you very high in the search results. So if it would do that, actually, that would be malicious practice. It will be detected by Google, and it may actually skip your website from the search results. Search engine optimization can be very neatly done by specifying the necessary information in the robots.txt. Robots.txt is a file that every website should have and which is going to direct search bots like the Google bot and crawlers through your website. So it's going to define, it could define different behavior for different search bots. So maybe the Google bot needs to work differently than the Yahoo bot or the MSN bot from Microsoft. Using robots.txt, I can tell every of those search bots what pages it can see, what pages it cannot see. Sometimes you do not want certain pages of your website to be indexed, to be known by Google or Yahoo, because they contain too specific information. Well, I can specify that in the robots.txt file using the keywords allow, which gives access to search bots to certain pages, or disallow, which is going to prevent search bots from crawling certain pages. I can also foresee a crawl delay. I can say, look, um, if the Google bot searches my website, I want to make sure that it can visit, or that after each visit of a web page, it needs to wait for two or three minutes before it can look at the next web page. You do that to not overload your website. You don't want the Google bot overloading your website whilst other users are also inspecting information on your website. By means of the crawl delay, I can specify, look, if somebody visited a particular page, if a Google bot or any kind of bot visited a particular page, it needs to wait at least two or three minutes before it can visit another page. A sitemap is then an overview of the website hierarchy with plenty of information for the Google bot or any kind of search bot. Here, by the way, you see the robots.txt file from Twitter, so you can see what pages uh, the, the Google bot or any kind of other bot can see and what pages it cannot see. Hmm? This is specified by means of the allow and disallow keyword. A sitemap is an overview of the web pages that can be crawled, right? So um, it has a common format. It will typically be an XML. So it's based upon a particular XML scheme, which will provide the location of the URL the date when the URL was last modified, the change frequency of the page. So if you have a page with a high change frequency, it means that it is frequently being changed. So it is worthwhile for the Google bot or any search bot to inspect the page since it's being frequently being changed. If it would be a page that is not frequently being changed, uh, the Google bot can work a little bit more efficient by skipping the page because it's not frequently being changed. And then you also have a priority indicator, which is going to give us the relative importance of the URL according to other pages, other URLs in that particular website. You can see an example of the sitemap for Amazon, right, for a particular page on Amazon. Uh, so you see the URLs, you can see last modified, and all kinds of other information like priority, the change frequency to the right, the change frequency, which could be daily, which could be weekly, which could be monthly, etc. Okay, so by means of the search, by means of the sitemap, you're actually doing the search engine optimization in a very efficient way. For video content, uh, there's more information that you can give that could facilitate the crawling by the Google and Yahoo bots. You can specify the content of the video, the title, where the thumbnail is located. You can also specify the duration of the, minute, oh, the, duration of the video, whether it's family friendly, yes or no, etc. So there's lots of more information that you can specify in your sitemap depending upon the object that you're looking at. Okay, how does Google work? Well, Google works according to the PageRank algorithm. And a PageRank algorithm says that a page is important if it is connected to another important page. So in order for a page to be important by Google, first there needs to be the content, right? and then it needs to have lots of incoming references. If a page has lots of incoming references, it means that it has something useful to say. So it should not only have lots of incoming references, but it should have also references from other important pages, right? So this basically is the democratic nature of the internet, right? So here you can see that page C, for example, is a very important page. 
despite the fact that it has only one incoming link. The reason that page C is so important is because it has an incoming link from page B, which is also very important. Hmm? Here you can see how Google search works. So search, first it's going to search for pages matching a given query using text matching. So if you do, for example, uh, uh, cheap laptops, first it's going to look for the keyword cheap laptops and it's going to find websites that are connected to the keyword cheap laptops. And then it's going to determine the ranking of a web page using the page rank algorithm we just described. So here you can see the formula at the bottom of my slide. You can see that the page rank of page I, right, XI, depends upon um, the page ranks of all the pages that connect to page I. So AJI is the element of an adjacency matrix, which is going to specify whether there's a link from J to I. KI out is the out degree of page I, or, yep, yeah, the, the out degree of page J, I mean. So this is going to specify, there's a typo there, so that should be KJ out. So KJ out is the out degree of page J, is the number of outgoing links from J. And alpha is then a damping parameter, a kind of constant value there. But you see that the page rank of a particular page depends upon the page rank of other pages that connect to that particular page. Here you can see the page rank algorithm uh, illustrated iteratively. So to the right, you see three web pages A, B, and C with their link structure. You have the adjacency matrix A. And the page ranks are then calculated iteratively. That means in iteration zero, you start by assigning every page, a page rank of one, then you apply the formula until you see some stability. And then you can see that page B, for example, has a very high page rank value, has the highest of the three page rank values. You can also abuse this uh, Google page rank and come up with a Google bomb. And the Google bomb means that, you know, you're going to try and, and bully a person or a website. Now, as the Americans invaded Iraq some time ago. Many people did not like this, actually opposed the idea of using violence um, in Iraq. So what they did was they started a hate community and they massively linked to the site of the White House using the keyword failure. Now, if you start to massively link with lots of people to the site of the White House using the keyword failure, then Google will detect that, such that at some point, if somebody enters failure into Google, the first site that you will get in the search result is a site to the White House. And that happened at some moment in time. Okay? This is a Google bomb, right? And uh, of course, this is not something uh, that should occur. So if it occurs, then you can always report it to Google, and then Google will break up the link and make sure that the Google bomb is um, destroyed. A very popular advertising tool by Google is Google AdWords. It's a keyword-based advertising system whereby you can specify keywords that are going to connect or should connect to your website. And the ranking of the ad is based on cost per click bidding campaigns. You can actually bid to, for a link to your website to be included in the sponsored link section of Google. You can do that using pay-per-click which means you only pay when somebody clicks on your ad, but you can also specify a maximum cost per click, which is the highest amount that you're willing to pay for a click on your ad. Okay. Below, you see uh, some uh, ads, for example, all related to bank accounts. Obviously, the pay-per-click for A will be bigger than the pay-per-click for B, and then the pay-per-click for C, since this is the priority listing. When you set up your Google AdWords, campaign, you can specify a headline, two description lines, you can specify the URL that Google should connect to, you can um, enter some keywords, you can also specify the geographic region if you want, right? Specify the geographic region, Belgium. So you can really customize your ads to particular geographical region or customer populations. Local ads will then also be integrated with Google Maps, right? And they will show a business address and the location uh, where it is being located, right? So if you would search for hotels in Leuven using Google AdWords and Google Maps, you can find a very nice um, map of all hotels located in Leuven, for example. 
An ad network. An ad network is a very sophisticated way of doing advertising. An ad network is basically a kind of intermediary between publishers and advertisers. Let's imagine you set up your own um, website and you're a soccer fan, right? So you're a soccer fan and you're a fan of a particular soccer team and you want to set up your own website with all kinds of information about your team, uh, the games they play, trainings, etc. So actually you could try and gain some money from your website by using an ad, work, an ad network to do the advertising on your website. And one of those ad networks is Google AdSense. So you can actually let Google AdSense put the advertisements based upon your website. So Google AdSense will then look at what is your website all about. It sees it's about soccer, so it could put all kinds of ad advertisements there for uh, Nike sport shoes, for soccer, um, for, for, um, soccer material, for uh, soccer magazines, etc. So Google AdSense will do the advertising for you, right? So an ad network is an intermediary between advertisers and publishers, whereby the network and the publisher each get their share of the overall revenue. The ad network brings in an entire group of advertisers and publishers at once. So I have my website on soccer, I can just register it with Google AdSense, and then Google AdSense has a whole bunch of advertisers that could advertise on my webpage. There's also quality control of accepted partners because you know Google Ad Network is a well-established um, is a well-established partner, so it has quality control of both the publishers and the advertisers. There's also automatic ad rotation. So if I have my website on soccer, the ads I see in the morning could be different than the ads I see in the evening. The ads I see when I log on to my website from Belgium could be different than the ads I see when I log on to my website from the United States, let's say. So there's automatic ad rotation. Allows the publisher and the advertiser to control various campaign parameters. You know, supports various forms of targeting, right? I could do geographical targeting and say, I want only my ads to appear in Belgium. I want only my ads to appear um, in the United States. I could also do day targeting, whereby I say, look, I want only my ads to appear in the morning or in the evening. The ad networks also foresee all kinds of tracking facilities, which allow you to track your ads to see how many people clicked on your ads, how many people came to your website, from where they came to your website, and so on. All of this can be very efficiently tracked using the idea of ad networks. So, examples are Google AdSense, that's probably the most uh, well-known. So I can target my ads to particular geographical regions, and I can say, um, if I'm a, um, a shoe seller, I only want uh, my ads appearing in Belgium or in um, the United States. I can also do demographic targeting. I only want to have my ads appearing to males aged between 18 and 34. Psychographic targeting, I only want to see my ads appearing to travel enthusiasts. I want to do some day parting, which means that you want to cut the day into hours and say, I want to see my ads appearing in the morning or in the evening. I can also do it based upon bandwidth. I can do pixel targeting, meaning that you're only targeting particular pixels. You're only targeting particular parts of the computer screen and say, I want to have my ads appearing in the upper right corner of the computer screen, lower right corner, and so on. Contextual targeting means that uh, ads will appear based upon the web page content you know, by means of keyword matching and or analysis of the page content. So you look at the content of the page, and if it's about soccer, uh, you, the ads that will appear will only will all be related to um, soccer, to the theme of soccer, to the context of soccer. It could also be behavioral targeting, right? Behavioral targeting means that the targeting is not only based upon the content of that one particular uh, website, but also is based upon the same websites or other websites that the user visited earlier. If I visited earlier other websites, uh, I visited Amazon, I visited um, uh, Nike website and so on, and then I go to my soccer website, then the ads appearing there could also be based upon the websites that I visited earlier. That is behavioral advertising, whereby the ad network is going to try and have an idea about your particular interests, about your particular behavior. So this is typically based upon past browsing behavior, and the ad network can have an idea about that by using cookies, for example. 
Here you can see Google AdSense. So this is a website on weather forecasting in, um, in Belgium. And you can see some ads which have been put there by Google AdSense. Google AdSense is going to make use of different types of cost schemes. It can do cost per click, which means that the amount you earn each time, which, which specifies the amount you earn each time a user clicks on an ad on your website. Right? That could be, again, the result of a bidding process. We can also work along the revenue per thousand impressions. That's the estimated earnings for every 1,000 impressions or cost per action. That means you pay when a particular action occurred. And the action could be anything. It could be a purchase of a product or service. It could be a request for information. It could be downloading a PDF. It could be signing up for a newsletter. It could be a like on a Facebook page and so on. Yahoo has a very similar product, which is called Content Match. Social advertising is advertising the way Facebook is going to do it. So here we're going to look at a social network like Facebook. We're going to look at a network of users. And the advertisement will be based upon your own profile, your own interest. But it could also be based upon what your friends are interested in. Because if you're connected to somebody, and this person likes a particular movie, likes a particular book, then maybe you're going to end up liking it as well. Now, you have to be careful with that if you do lots of Facebook advertising, because Facebook has invaded privacy quite substantially in the past. Right? In the past, when people purchased certain products on certain websites, that information was passed along to Facebook without the users knowing it. Such, such that if somebody purchased a Christmas present on a particular website for his or her girlfriend or boyfriend, then that information was passed along to Facebook and then the girlfriend or boyfriend could see what their partner has purchased for their Christmas. Hence the quote, Facebook has ruined my Christmas surprise. Okay, Facebook advertising, well here you can see some social ads appearing to the right, some sponsored ads. They're being put there depending upon the profile of the person, depending upon the friends, and depending upon the actions of the friends. The ad content is not only based upon cookies, but as I said, also based upon the demographic data of the Facebook profile. There are two possibilities for Facebook ad pricing. There's pay for impressions, whereby you pay for a number of impressions, or there's pay for clicks, whereby you're going to pay for a number of clicks. In Facebook advertising, we can define a maximum bid per ad, and we can also define a maximum daily amount. Facebook has something very um, sophisticated, which is the idea of the open graph, whereby it provided an API, an application programming interface, that programmers or website designers of other websites can use in order to interact with Facebook for doing advertising. So it allows developers to connect their product to the Facebook social network. And that could just be by means of a like button. So on a particular website, you have a like button, and if somebody clicks it, a connection is going to be made to a particular to Facebook saying that a user liked a particular product or item. Right? And that could be movies that you watch, that could be games that you played, or books that you read. That way, your activities on particular websites are propagated to your friends so as to influence your friends. Usually, an open graph notification consists of four elements. So we have the actor, which is the Facebook user. We have the action, or played a game, finished reading a book, watched a movie. We have the object, so it could be a book, a song, a movie. And we have the app, which is the name of the app. That could be Spotify, Goodreads, and so on. So all that information can then, by means of open graph, be exchanged between a website and Facebook, such that you can see whether your friends read a particular book, what book, uh, what app, uh, etc. You can see it with the Internet Movie Database. You can see a, a simple like button here in the right part of the screen, such that if you like a particular movie, all the information is being passed along to Facebook saying that you like the particular movie, together with the movie title, etc. So there's all kinds of additional information that you can pass along to Facebook as part of the open graph protocol. Uh, you can pass along information about a video movie, about a TV show, about a music song, about an album, about a book. 
you can pass along the title, the description, the URL. So all of that could be implemented as information that you pass along to Facebook. There exist even very structured properties that you can pass along. You can specify the content of a music album, the duration, the musician, uh, you can pass along, etc. Can you even also pass along information about more than one album if a song would belong to more than one album? You can specify both along with the meta tags in open graphs such that they're successfully being sent on to Facebook. YouTube is another way of advertising on the internet. Um, YouTube is a very important uh, internet channel, lots of movies. Um, there are different ways of advertising on YouTube. We can reach customers as they discover videos, right? So we can do promoted videos, but we can also reach customers as they watch videos. Typically very annoying if you ask me, but those are those ads that appear in a video. We can also reach customers as they engage. You can come up with brand channels, right? You can have the Coca-Cola brand channel, which has lots of movies and lots of things related to Coca-Cola. Even games, contests, etc., that you can participate in. Here you can see the YouTube Coca-Cola channel, for example. You also have online sponsorship, whereby you have an advertiser which is going to sponsor an entire site, online event, or an email message. Think about Marktrock, for example, if Marktrock is being organized here in Leuven in August, you can have a company which is going to sponsor the setup of the Mark, Marktrock website, for example. You can also make use of games to advertise a product or service. This is what we call advert gaming. Coupon sites, where you have all those kind of coupon sites, think about Groupon, Cool Savings, those are models where you can actually register first, so you provide the site with all kinds of information about yourself, such that the site gets an idea about who you are, what your interests are, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And then it will target coupons based upon your individual, your specific profile. Viral marketing? Well, viral marketing is marketing that spreads like a virus. When Dan Brown came up with his book, The Da Vinci Code, he gave it away to 10,000 influential readers for free hoping that those readers will actually going to give very good blog reviews uh, about the book. This is actually what occurred, and we had a viral effect, right? Because many people started liking the book, many people started purchasing the book. So viral marketing or viral advertising is a marketing technique which is going to use social networks like Facebook or like Twitter for spreading an advertisement message. It very much resembles the spread of pathological viruses, hence the name viral marketing. Mm -hmm. Viral promotions typically gonna take the form of funny video clips, um, interactive flash games, etc. Mm -hmm. So here you can see a viral marketing example. A bunch of folks that set up a beer website, beer.com, which contained lots of information on beer, beer festivals, types of beer, beer reviews, and so on. And in order to make their website very attractive, they developed a virtual bartender application, which was a Java-based application that um, had two very pretty girls pouring beers behind a bar. So the virtual bartender application also had a command prompt, and any user can then enter all kinds of commands in that command prompt. That was very exciting when you received that virtual bartender application. So what they did, they sent a link to the website, including the virtual bartender application, to some of their friends. They sent it to some of their friends, and so on. And at day one, they had more than 15,000 sessions. Day two, they had 30,000 sessions. There were fan forums that appeared uh, and that discussed the different commands that you can enter in the virtual bartender application, and so on. At day six, they had more than 500,000 sessions, which was really very spectacular. We already briefly touched upon it, but when you're doing online advertising, there are, very pri there are different pricing models that you can adopt. Uh, there's cost per thousand or mil impressions, CPM, whereby an impression is the display of an ad on a particular publisher's website. Um, allows you to brand a business name, you buy a guaranteed number of appearances of your ad, a couple of thousands of impressions. Prices vary widely um, from less than $1 CPM for general interest publications with few readers to over $65 CPM for the Wall Street Journal. You can also do cost per click, which means that the advertiser is only going to pay, in case, a click 
occurs. So a click is a user who clicks on your ad and visits your website. That could be settled according to a fixed price or according to an auction. Or you can also have a cost per action. Cost per action means that you only pay when a particular action has occurred. Of course, here you have to specify the type of action. That could be a visitor registering or requesting information. That could be a visitor also making a purchase, etc. The most typical, the most frequently used models are CPM and CPC. Of course, this also creates lots of opportunities for click fraud. Right? Imagine that your competitor has a CPC model, cost per click campaign. Well, if I'm a firm, I could deplete my uh, competitor's marketing budget by every now and then clicking on a link to his website. Okay? On the other hand, if I want to earn some money myself, I could also click on a link to my own website. So um, there are lots of opportunities for click fraud um, whereby you have a person or an automated script or a computer program which is going to imitate a real or legitimate user of a web browser clicking on an ad for the purpose of generating a charge per click. So I can repeatedly click ads on my own website in order to gain some money myself or I can also click on the ads uh, of my competitor's website in order to deplete his marketing budget. Mm -hmm. There have been some cases, here you can see a case, we're not going to discuss it, but this was a case um, whereby Google also got involved in click fraud. So I uh, leave it up to you to read it. Okay, so that finishes this part on online advertising. The next session will be on web analytics.